Good morning. Welcome to Elkdale Baptist Church online service. I'm Pastor Corey, and I'm so glad you've joined us. This morning, we have the opportunity through digital means to worship together. But I'm excited to tell you that next Sunday, we're going to begin opening our building for morning worship. We will continue to stream for those of you that are staying home, but we're going to offer three opportunities for worship, 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11. What I'd love for you to do is take some time to go over to elkdale.org, that's elkdale.org, and you can read all the information about how we're going to come back together and worship. We're going to need you to register for one of those services, so make sure you visit our website. Now, in the month of May, we've been taking up our Acts 1-8 mission offering. This offering is set aside especially for Elkdale mission opportunities. We use this money to help fund our mission trips and our local mission ministries. Let me encourage you, if you've not given uh, to this offering yet, make a note to mark it in your online giving or maybe drop off a check or bring it next Sunday to worship. Just make sure you tell us it's for Acts 1-8. Now, I want to invite you to stay tuned after the service this morning. When I get done preaching, we're going to have a special presentation of our seniors through video. We're going to get to celebrate the accomplishment of them graduating from school and hear from JB, our student minister, about where they're going and how we can pray for them. So make sure you stay tuned after the worship service. Now let me invite you to enter into worship with us. Good morning. I'm going to invite you, wherever you are, to worship with us. Let's sing together. How firm our foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in His excellent word. What more can He say than to you He has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus has Sustainer 
And we believe that. We believe that whenever we rest our lives on who God is, on Jesus Christ himself, that we have nothing to fear. In fact, Jesus himself said, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Church, this morning, let's, let's use this next song as a prayer. That, that God would help us to build our lives upon him, that, we would, that our whole existence would be resting on the fact that we are his children. And because of that, because we're, we've been saved from our sins, we have nothing to fear, and, 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 and we live this life in love for him who died and gave himself for us. So church, let's sing together the solid rock. constantly resting, constantly trusting in the name of Jesus, in whose name we pray these things. Amen. Well, let me invite you to take out your copy of God's Word or turn on your device, and we are continuing our series and walking through the Ten Commandments found in Exodus chapter 20. These famous ten rules or laws given by God to the nation of Israel and 
and they're such a, a pillar of just the Old Testament, but also the whole Bible and, and really throughout the history of, of Israel and throughout the history of the church, they've been an anchor for societies. And so we as a church want to pour over these and, and learn them. And in fact, we've, we've committed together as a church family, and I hope you're working on it, we've committed together to memorize Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, where it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The reason why we memorize this verse is because it is the setting for the Ten Commandments. And it is a reminder to us that the Ten Commandments were given to the nation of Israel out of grace. God had already saved them. He had already called them His people. And then He gives them the rules by which they are to live in a relationship with Him. So, so the Ten Commandments for us are rules to follow, are expressions of our love towards God, but they are most importantly a response to His grace. And so then we have this memorizing list we're working on. You can find them at our website, elkdale.org, but we're working on this list. And the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself an idol. The third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And then today we add to it this Fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Now, this fourth commandment is probably one that brings the most controversy or the most questions when it comes to how do we observe it and what does it mean? In my house growing up, the Sabbath was identified primarily with Sunday, the day of church, the day of worship. And it was different in my home. On Sunday, we put on our best clothes and we went to church and and gathered with people and we worshiped. But we also had some some rules on Sunday. We were never allowed to cut the grass on Sunday if that was our chore and we didn't get it done. We were uh, not allowed to necessarily do things that would take us away from the house for a long time or or keep us from being uh, in church when worship was there. I remember one time when my brother and I were big enough to ride our bikes away from the house, and and we would go down to a nearby pond of another church member, and we were fishing in their pond on a Sunday afternoon, and we caught some catfish. Now, my brother and I were still small in the sense that we brought the catfish back, but we didn't get back home until right before night church was to begin. So we only had enough time to slick down our hair and put on a clean shirt, and we left the fish in the cooler. And that night after church, after my dad had preached, after everybody had left, after we'd locked the doors, I remember him cleaning catfish on the side of a pine tree with a flashlight reminding us that we will never do this on Sunday again, that it became a Sabbath rule, if you will. And that's really the question. When the Bible says, keep the Sabbath holy, what does it mean? Does it mean we're not supposed to cut grass on Sunday or or get tickets to the football game? Or does it mean that we have to take a nap and rest on Sunday? I'm certainly for that one. What, What exactly does it mean? Well, I want you to see this morning, as we look at this passage of Scripture, as we look at this commandment, That when the Lord says, keep the Sabbath holy, remember it and keep it holy, He's not giving us a list of rules. He's giving us a a moral obligation to focus on Him. He's giving us not an obligation and a slavery to some list of legal ideas. He's giving us freedom to set aside a whole day dedicated to worshiping and walking and resting in Him. In fact, I would say simply this, The commandment to keep the Sabbath holy is not burdensome. It's a gift from God. It is good for us. Let's read it together. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, or your livestock, or your sojourner who's within your gates. For in the six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that's in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Let's pray together. Father, help us now as we understand what it means to keep the Sabbath. We know this is your law. We know it is for us to observe and to express to you in love and obedience. And so help us, Father, understand what does it mean for us to to keep the Sabbath holy, to remember it. What does it mean for us, especially those of us who now live on this side of the cross, who live on this side of Christ, who who, who don't observe the Jewish holidays out of obligation of religion, Father. So, So help us, Lord, to see what does this mean? 
And Father, more than anything, I pray that that you would show us that it's not about legalism or rules, that it's not about obligation, but that it's about celebration of a relationship with the God Most High. And so, Lord, help us. Help us see what it means to rest. And ultimately, Father, I pray you would help us to see what it means to rest in Christ our Savior. Father, even now, as I proclaim this message, as I read your word, there are those that are watching and listening that their life is in turmoil, anxiety is high, their relationships are struggling. They find themselves a long ways from rest. Lord, I pray that today you would show them through your word and through the person of Christ where true rest is found. God bless our time in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we dive into this commandment, there's a couple of observations we should make. First, we should note that of the Ten Commandments, this one gets the most words. It is the longest of the Ten Commandments. It has the most explanation. And so for us to relegate this idea of the Sabbath to something we no longer have to pay attention to would be uh, a very faulty in our thinking. The Lord gives much attention to this idea of the Sabbath. And it's not very hard to understand if you look at the passage. Verse 8 is the commandment, what we're called to do. Verses 9 and 10, he tells them how to do it, what they're supposed to do. And then in verse 11, he simply says, this is why you are to keep the Sabbath. So there's a, there's a clear understanding that God has a, a, a command. He has a, a, a details of how to follow it. And then he has a reason for giving it to us. Now, the other observation I want to make before we dive into this and, and apply it to our lives is simply this. We understand that in the Old Testament, the Sabbath was Saturday. That the, In the Jewish world, that the Sabbath was Saturday. It's still that way in the uh, non-Christian Jewish world. The nation of Israel and the Jews would, would celebrate the Sabbath as Saturday. And that patterns all through the Old Testament. So the question has to come up, we in the Christian faith, in the New Testament faith, we have to ask ourselves, why do we not gather or keep Saturday as the Sabbath? Well, I want you to understand that, that the overarching conviction that I have on this text and, and the New Testament church has had since Christ's resurrection is that the idea of keeping the Sabbath is far less about a specific day and far more about a real day, an obvious day. And what I mean by that is simply this. Our call to keep the Sabbath holy is a moral call for our heart and our affection and our attention to be towards God. It is not necessarily a call to circle a specific day of the week and set it aside. It is a call to set aside a day of the week, but not necessarily a specific one. And I think I can help you understand this maybe even clearer by looking at the writings of Paul. Paul would write in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, these words. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to festivals or new moons, or here it is, or a Sabbath. These are the shadows of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. What Paul is simply saying is, for thousands of years, the Israelites, the Jewish nation, the Israel, uh, people of Israel kept the Sabbath. They kept Saturday holy. They set it aside. But what he simply says is, is now that we are in Christ, we understand that true rest and true salvation and true worship is found in Christ. And therefore, it's not tied to a specific day. It's tied to a person that is Christ. And so we find uh, that we don't have to necessarily hold it to that. And what we see in the New Testament pattern is that their day of worship certainly very quickly became Sunday, the first day, tied to the resurrection of Christ. We see this in 1 Corinthians where it says, and they gathered on the first day. We see this in Acts chapter 20 where they gathered on the first day. The Christians would tie their resurrection, their, excuse me, their rest to Christ. Now, why is that? Well, let me give you one more idea here and then we'll dive into the text. And that's simply this. In the Old Testament, they worked for six days, and then they rested. They worked towards rest. And this was a prediction and a prophecy of what was to come, the rest that God would provide, that you will labor for now and that rest will come. But when Christ comes on the scene, 
And when Christ comes and, and is crucified and buried and rose from the grave, now we as believers in Christ know that we have found that ultimate rest in Christ, that we found salvation in Christ, that we no longer are in turmoil in need of rest, that we found it in Christ. So now, instead of working towards rest, we rest on the first day and then we work. Why? Because we are working out of a rest, not working towards a rest. And so we find that Sunday is the day in which we celebrate the resurrection. But let me state this, and then I promise we'll dive into the text. There is no evidence in the New Testament where Sunday replaces the Sabbath. There's no evidence in the New Testament where those two are so linked together that the Jews keep the Sabbath holy and that we are to keep the Sunday holy. Now, traditionally, we have, we've set it aside as a fabric of our society, it's the day of resurrection. I think it is certainly necessary for us to gather together, and we'll get to that in a moment. But if somehow, in some way, in some form or fashion, you're in a city, in a setting, in a culture, in a part of the world where the day you set aside is Thursday, that's not sinful. That's not unbiblical. Because there is no connection between Sabbath and Sunday in the New Testament. Now, with all of that said, here's the question. What does it mean for you and me to keep the Sabbath holy? How do we remember the Sabbath and keep it holy? Well, I think there are two ideas that we find in the text and draw from other places in the Old Testament. The first idea is simply this. Remembering the Sabbath means we stop or we cease working. Remembering the Sabbath means we cease working or we stop working. We we put aside work. Let me show you what I mean. Look at verse 8. It says, first, we are to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Now, the word Sabbath literally means cease working, to stop working. So the the definition of the word Sabbath means sit, stop, don't work. Now, there are two other words in verse 8 that we need to see. The first one is simply this, remember. So he calls on the nation of Israel to remember to not work. Remember to uphold this day as a day in which you cease. Now, The reason why I bring that up to you is because the word remember here is not just the idea of having some cognitive recollection. It is the meaning of doing something based on that memory. If I were to tell you that August is my anniversary, and when my anniversary rolls around on August the 2nd, and I think to myself, I remember my anniversary. But I don't call my wife, I don't get her flowers, I don't take her to dinner, I don't buy her a gift, I don't do anything to celebrate it. You and I both know that my cognitive remembering of it didn't help me. It didn't do anything. It didn't symbolize that it was special to me. So in the nation of Israel here, when God says, remember the Sabbath, he's actually calling them to do something with that memory. And what is he calling them to do? Well, look at verse 8. He says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Holy is the idea of being set apart, to be carved out. So literally, what the Lord is commanding is simply this. There is to be a literal day where you carve out and you stop working in order to remember what? Well, that's where the rest of the text comes in. We are to remember the Lord. We are to remember what He has done. We are to remember who He is. We are to remember how He has set a pattern in front of us. And so the very first thing we are to do in order to maintain this idea of Sabbath is we are to set aside a day in order to stop working. We are to stop working. We are to move away from doing our normal work throughout the week. We are to rest or stop from working. You can see this clearly in verse 9 and 10. It says, here's how you do it. Here's how you set it apart. Here's how you keep it holy. Labor for six days, do all your work, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, the Lord your God, on it shall not do any work. Your sons, your daughters, your servants, your sojourners, no one inside your gates, no one in your house, no one under your care should do any work on the Sabbath. And so the Lord has called us to this. Now, why would the Lord call them to have a special day where they set aside not working? Why are we to cease working? Well, I think there's kind of two reasons here why we're called to stop working. Uh, Reason number one is simply this. We are to do it because it follows the pattern of God. Look with me at verse 11. He says these words in verse 11. For the sea, excuse me, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So what the Lord does here in Exodus chapter 20 is he goes all the way back to the very first work week recorded in the Bible. 
the very first work week recorded in all of eternity. That is the work week where God created the world. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and here again in Exodus chapter 20, that God created the world in six days, that He spoke the world into existence, day one and day two and day three, culminating with creating man and woman in His own image. And then finally, the Bible says that on the seventh day, He rested. Now, let us see the irony in this. Brothers and sisters, when the Bible says that God rested on the seventh day, it does not mean that he had to prop up his feet and ice his ankles. It does not mean that his back was aching from the work of creation. He did not need to go to the heavenly refrigerator and find Gatorade in order to replenish his electrolytes. That is not what the word rested mean for the Lord in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. The word rested in the, in the sense of Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is simply that the Lord was pleased that he had completed his work. And then he rested. But here in Exodus chapter 20, we are told that because the Lord rested, we are to rest. Why? Because it's simply this. Not only was the nation of Israel given a command to follow rest, but they were given a pattern. Because God rested, you are to rest. You see, I believe that the Sabbath is a gift. It's a gift from God. Why? Because God knew our bodies would need to sit down. Our laborers would need a break. God knew that our hearts would need replenishing. God knew that we would be busy six days a week and that there would be a day where we need to stop and reflect and ponder and restore and rejuvenate. And so God built that into the creation pattern in order to set it in front of us saying, this is what I have done, you do it also. We are to cease working because it is the pattern of God. Now, We should learn a couple of other things about this idea of cease working here because it's the pattern of God. One, work is good. Work is a good thing. God created the world. There was no sin. Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 and 2 were placed in the garden and told to care for the garden. Work came before sin. Work is not the result of sin. No matter how much you may despise your job, the idea of man and woman working, whether it be in the home or outside the home, the idea of working is not sinful. Now, certainly, because of sin, work has become more difficult. Because of sin, work has become harder because sinners are the ones doing the job. Work has become uh, uh, more challenging, but work in itself is good. And in this pattern, God says we are to get up six days a week and do work, do labor, toil with our hands, toil with our abilities, make the necessary resources we need to provide for our families and bless others and, and bring to the storehouse of the church. God is giving us six days to do the earthly tasks that we need to do. But then he says on the seventh day, Stop it. Cease. Don't work. So what is meant by this? It is meant to set aside a day. Now think about how gracious God is. God could have demanded, you give me six days and only work one day, and I hope you get it all done on that one day. That's not what he did. He said, I'll I'll give you six days to get all of the things you need done in your earthly task in order to take care of your crops and your fields and your factories and your jobs and in order to provide for your family. And in return, you set aside one day for me. What a good and gracious master he is. That he would give us just this task of saying, go and work, but on this one day, stop working. You might say, well, that seems kind of odd of God. Well, think about the mercy in it. Let's say this, one uh, uh, illustration I've heard put it this way. said, what if you were to come upon someone in need of money and they are asking for money and, and you pull out of your pocket $7 and you take $1 and put it in your right hand and you hand this person who's in desperate need of money the other $6 and the person in their anger towards you begins to whoop on you, beat on you in order to snatch the $1 and run away. Now, we would say to ourselves, how ungrateful, how mean. We gave them six. Why would be they so ugly to take the seventh? That's exactly what the Lord is doing in this commandment. I've given you six days. They are your days, in a metaphorical sense, to toil, to work, to do what you're supposed to do. Now, set aside one for me, how gracious he is that he has did this for us. And we should also observe in verses 9 and 10 that God is good to employees. Notice what he's telling them. He's saying you have to let your uh, workers, your male workers, your female workers, your children, you've got to let your cattle rest. Everything is to go into rest on the Sabbath day. Now that's good. Some of you are in positions where you're over people, where you supervise them, where you run companies and businesses. Is this your practice? 
Are you giving them rest? Are you giving them opportunities to unplug and seek after God? And some of you work in places where they don't provide this type of rest. Maybe it's time to examine where you work and why you're not doing this because the Lord is, has seen in his care to give us that everyone should do this. Now, there's a second idea here about the idea of stopping work. Not only is it to follow God's pattern, but I believe it's to uh, trust his provisions. Think about it for just a moment. In this idea, the Lord is telling them, you may toil and work for six days. Now, they lived, the nation of Israel, 3,000 plus years ago, in an agricultural trade-based society. So if I was a tent maker, I had to get the tent sewed in order to sell it. And the faster I sewed it, the more I could sell them. And that would help support my family. If I was in agriculture, the more I worked the garden, the better opportunity I would have to reap the crop. Or, or the more I worked the herds, the better opportunity I would have to have fatter calves or fatter lambs. And so working was something I needed to do in order to produce for my family. But notice what God is doing. God is simply saying one day a week, you have to stop working. Now, brothers and sisters, for those of us that have grown up in the society of rat race and almighty dollar and seeking that which we want, one more thing and one more thing, the idea of setting aside a day where we unplug from work is to say to God, we know you're in charge. We trust you. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this day where we can once again cut the strings of greed from our heart. We can stop and trust you. Yes, Lord. If I worked one more shift today, if I worked one more hour today, if I just went to work one more extra day, oh, how much more money I could have for my family. But Lord, I trust you. I'm with you. We see this sin in the nation of Israel in the rest of the Old Testament. In fact, in Amos chapter 8, verse 4 and 6, listen to what the Lord through the prophet says to the nation of Israel. He says, hear this. You who trample on the needy and bring the poor to the land to the end, saying, when will the new moon be over? What when we sell grain? And the Sabbath, that we may offer what is for sale, that we may make the ephah and small and shekel and great and deal deceitfully in false balance. He's literally saying that the people of Israel were declaring, I'll be glad when the Sabbath is over so I can get back to making money. They were using it. They were worried about it. They were, they were building with this. And we do this in our own heart. Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft and billionaire himself, had this to say about religion. He said simply, just in terms of allocation of time resources, religion is not very efficient. There's a lot more I could be doing on Sunday morning. And brothers and sisters, based on his bank account and who he is, he has reaped the reward he went after. But oh, oh, what a reward it will be when all of those dollars puff into smoke when he stands before the Lord. You see, brothers and sisters, one of the reasons why the Lord gives us the Sabbath and says stop working is so that we will follow his pattern. We will rest. We will be rejuvenated. We'll let things cease. But the other reason is simply this. It's a weekly pattern of a reminder to say, Lord, I trust in you. You will provide for me my daily bread. Yes, my job is a gift from you, but it is not my all and all. You, Lord, are who I trust and who I seek after. You, Lord, or who my heart desires. You, Lord, is where I am after. The Lord's day is his. In Leviticus chapter 19, he declares this, and even in chapter 23, verse 3, he says, six days you shall work and it be done. But the seventh day is the Sabbath, a solemn day of rest, a holy convocation. I mean, it's a gathering. You shall be, you shall do no work. It is the Sabbath. It is the Lord's. In Leviticus chapter 19, he says, it's my Sabbath. We are to stop working and set it aside for him. Now, let me address just a couple of things about this idea of stopping work and, and giving it over to the Lord, trusting the Lord. When I say you stop work or you cease from work, that does not mean that essential things shouldn't be done or good things should not be done. We find that this idea of stopping work has been abused not only throughout Scripture and in the New Testament especially, but even in our own lives. When Jesus comes on the scene in the New Testament, there's one place in the Gospels where there is a man who literally has a withered hand. He has a he has deformity from birth, and it's the Sabbath. It's the Jewish Sabbath, the day of, of gathering in the temple and the day of no work. And they had all of these rules about what they were not allowed to do. They added to the commandment. They, they laid up rule after rule of what it meant to rest on the Sabbath. And the Bible records in the Gospels that Jesus literally healed the man, that he, that he made his hand come back out. And there's this great commotion and celebration. 
And the Pharisees, instead of being excited that this man from birth who's been deformed is now healed, they immediately accused Jesus of blaspheming God because he broke the Sabbath commandment. By healing the man, he did a work on the Sabbath. How foolish. How absurd. In fact, there is some Jewish writing from the early first century where there is literally a discussion on whether it's legal to retrieve the egg under a hen on the Sabbath. And the discussion goes like this. One, to retrieve the egg is work. And also, if the hen laid the egg on the Sabbath, the hen produced a work on the Sabbath by, quote, laboring the egg. And so therefore, we probably shouldn't gather or eat that egg. How foolish, brothers and sisters. The idea of stopping work on the Sabbath does not mean not doing what is necessary. If you have cows that need food, you feed them. If you have things that must be taken care of, if the house is on fire, you run in to rescue people. You do what is necessary and needed on the Sabbath. That is not the intent of the law. Here's the intent of the law. You stop doing what is normally done the other six days of the week. You stop doing the normal pattern of work in which you produce for your family or you produce in your work. You stop doing those normal things and you set aside, you make holy this day where you stop doing what is normal in order to focus on the Lord. It is not wrong to do things on the Sabbath. It's wrong to continue to do the pattern that you've been doing all the other days on your Sabbath. One author put it this way. He says, if you work seven days a week, you have nothing to look forward to. The Sabbath is to be the day where you stop, you cease from working. Now, let me say one other thought about this, and that's simply this. Stopping work doesn't mean all of a sudden the Sabbath becomes lazy day. Stopping work doesn't mean that the Sabbath means we just curl up on the couch and we don't go out and we binge Netflix all day long. That's not what Sabbath means. Sabbath means to remember what the Lord has done in His creation story. It is to pull back from work And it is to set aside, not thinking that we have to make money ourselves, but trusting his provision, following his pattern. And then the second part of this idea is not being lazy, but in turn focusing on the Lord, having a special day where we set aside to seek the Lord. And that brings us to the second truth of the text. And that's simply this. Remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy means we stop working, but it also means we start worshiping. We cease, we cease in working, but we celebrate in worship. We set aside the day for a special time of worship. Now, where do we draw this from out of the text? Well, I have to take you to another place in the Bible where this commandment is given again. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, it's given, and in verse 11 it says that you're to stop working because you are following the pattern that God created the world in six days and He rested. But in Deuteronomy chapter 5, when the commandment is referenced again, there's a a different motivation attached to it. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15, it says, You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there the mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God command you to keep the Sabbath day. So if you'll notice there, let's see if we kind of unpack this. In Exodus 20, we are told to keep the Sabbath because it follows the pattern of God stopping work and resting. And this idea of resting means that we look to God for our pattern and we look to God for our provisions and we realize that our jobs are not our our gods, that we don't worship them, that we don't seek after the throne room of everyday work trying to climb some ladder. That's not what we're supposed to do. But here in Deuteronomy 5, we're told that they were to keep the Sabbath holy, not just to remember creation, but to remember God rescuing them out of the nation of Israel in the book of Exodus. And so what do we draw from this? Well, we draw simply this. Brothers and sisters, we are to set aside a day in our week in which we stop working, we cease from working to follow the pattern of God and trust the provisions of God, but we are also to set aside a day of the week not only to celebrate God as creator, but to celebrate God as redeemer. The Sabbath is to be a day where we set aside, where we have a special time in order to worship God for Him rescuing us. The Sabbath. It's to celebrate, it's to stop and to remember that God has rescued us. And the beautiful thing about it is for us who live on this side of the cross, we don't have to go all the way back and look at the Exodus story 
we can look at Jesus. We can know that God has rescued us as Redeemer through Jesus, that Jesus came on this earth and that he took our sins, that he bore our restlessness and our brokenness and our strife between God. And he went to the cross and he was nailed there with our sin and God's wrath poured out on him. He experienced no rest on the cross, only agony, only wrath, only pain, only suffering. And then he was laid in the tomb that we should have been laid in because of our sin. But lo and behold, on that third day, on that Sunday, on that first day of the week. He rose from the grave. And now you know what Jesus declares? Jesus declares, all you who are heavy laden, come to me, for I will give you rest. You see, brothers and sisters, what Jesus does in the New Testament is he gets in an argument with the Pharisees about the Sabbath, and he ultimately looks at them and he says, do not tell me about the Sabbath, for I am the Lord of the Sabbath. That I am the one who's oh I am the one who's over the Sabbath. And essentially what he's saying is, I am the Sabbath. You want to find your rest, you find it in me, you find it in Christ. So for you and for I, we don't have to look to the Exodus story of the nation of Israel coming out of Egypt. We look to Calvary and we declare we have set aside this day in order to remind our hearts, in order to remind our souls, in order to stop from the busyness of life and to rest in God and celebrate not only that he is the creator, but he is our Redeemer. In fact, one author would put it this way. B.B. Warfield would write, he says, Christ took the Sabbath into the grave with him and brought the Lord's day out of the grave with him on that resurrection morn. He is the place where we find rest and all of us need this rest. And so what do we find? We find that in order to keep the Sabbath holy, to remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy, here's what you have to do. You have to build into your life a pattern where you set aside a day and you stop and you reflect on the fact that God rested, that God unplugged, that God told us that we shouldn't work every day, all day. But that rest doesn't mean that we just prop up our feet and we become lazy. That rest is, in fact, to be a focused time on the Lord. Thomas Watson would describe it this way. He would simply say, just as our body needs rest, so does our soul. He would describe the Sabbath as a day in which we tend to taking care of our heart. And he would say simply this, that the Sabbath, the gathering of God's people with God, the day in which we come before God, the day in which we we mark ourselves, set aside for God, is the day in which all of the work of the world that's frozen our heart melts away. For we are communing with the God of heaven. I think it's pretty practical, actually. I think God is doing what, what exactly we need. God, I, I wake up Monday morning and I, and I hit the grind and I go full speed and I'm, and I'm working and I'm solving problems and I'm, and I'm meeting the needs of my family and I'm, and I'm running off to this hobby and that hobby and we're getting to dance and Little League and, and we're doing these things and then we wake up and do it again on Tuesday and on Wednesday and on Thursday and on Friday and, and for some of you it's Saturday and Sunday, for some of you it's Monday or whatever your schedule may be. But, but in our week, the idea of keeping the Sabbath is simply this. Stopping for a day and saying, Lord, this is your day. We will focus on you. We will sing to you. We will worship you. We will hear from your word. We will pray with you. We will rest. We will not think about all the millions of things we should be doing in order to gain more income or more things because we trust in your provisions. We're following your pattern. We will celebrate you. We will set aside a day where we've been serving you all week long, being out and about in the world, and we will pull back. We will retreat, and we will allow you, like the balm of Gilead, to meet our needs to soothe our soul, to strengthen us. Brothers and sisters, this is what it means to keep the Sabbath. And everyone's called to do it. In Leviticus chapter 23, he says that this is to be a holy convocation, a group. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Do not forsake the gathering of the believers. We're all called together on this day of Sabbath in order to seek the Lord and rest and worship and come before Him. We are to do this. This is why. Traditionally, in, in our society, in our setting here in, in, in Alabama, uh, Sunday has become our Sabbath. It's become our day where we can gather with the church and worship. It's become our day where we don't have to clock in necessarily. It's become our day where we can rest intentionally with our family. That's why we've set it primarily in the rhythm of our calendar. But the, the morality in the heart of this commandment is not what day of the week you do. The morality in the heart of this commandment is that you trust the Lord and you unplug, and you worship Him. 
you set aside time to intentionally worship him. And really, you look forward to it. The nation of Israel looked forward to the Sabbath. They looked forward to the day where they sat down and sought the Lord and poured over his word. We should do the same. We should build in our heart a Sabbath where we sit down and we pray and we focus and we say, Lord, we're working towards that Sabbath and we're going to sit with you and communion with you in a very special way, a way not like any other day of the week. We're going to do this. And so as we close this idea of keeping the Sabbath, I, I want to give you, I think, three warnings that I, that I believe will help. The first one is simply this. You need to guard against ignoring the Sabbath. We can read this text and we can say, well, we're not Jews. Uh, we know Jesus Christ has come. We know church is on Sunday. We don't, we don't have to keep Saturday. And, and so we can ignore the teaching. But if we're not careful, while we may not keep Saturday as some special day, we are called by God to stop and reflect on who He is in a holy set-apart day. And so let me just encourage you, don't ignore the commandment of the Sabbath. Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law, not to abolish them. The, the moral, ethical calling of the Sabbath still rests on us. And so simply put, can I ask you, do you stop and unplug and enjoy the Lord on a day unlike any other day of the week? You stop from work. Do you put aside the accounting books? Do you put aside the school studying hours? Do you put aside all the chores of the normal week of being the house mom? Do you, do you sit and rest in the Lord, reflecting on Him, trusting in His provisions, following His pattern, and worshiping Him in a special way? Especially, and I would add this just out of conviction in the setting of where we are, especially if this is going to be the day that the church gathers. You gather with the church in a special way, set aside to worship Him. Don't ignore the Sabbath in your life. Friend, you may think, well, I'm working hard now to provide for my family, and, and in a while I'll be able to slow down and retire. Listen, disobedience now is disobedience. You might find yourself and say, well, I, I don't really work that hard anyway, so I'm just kind of lazy all the time. That, that's not the idea of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is to worship the Lord and set it aside and pull out from the pattern of this world. Let me give you a second one. We'll move quickly. Guard against isolating the Sabbath. Now, what do I mean by that? What I simply mean by that is if we're not careful, we can read this passage to say, I can live however I want to for six days as long as I keep that seventh day special. That's isolating the Sabbath. We see this in the culture of the, the Bible Belt all the time. We see people who will live Monday through Saturday as if God is not existing, as their moral code doesn't matter, if they live their life however they want to, as long as they get up on Sunday, take a shower, and make it to their pew, they're going to be okay. And brothers and sisters, that is not the call of this text. The nation of Israel was not told, keep the Sabbath holy and live like pagans the other six days. That's not what the commandments give us. We know this, the very first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself graven images. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Those were commandments that rested on every day of the week. And the rest of the commandments, as we follow them, thou shalt not steal or lie or commit adultery. Those rest on every day of the week. So God is calling us every day to be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. But we are called to have this one special day. So brother or sister, I urge you, do not think that just because you set aside one day to worship the Lord, you can live how you want to the other days. That is not what Sabbath means. That's called hypocrisy. And that's not good. And then there's a third and final thing we must guard against, and that's simply this. We must guard against idolatry of the Sabbath. This is kind of going to the other extreme. And this is the idea that somehow what you do on that day makes you right with God in a good way. You know, maybe on the Sabbath you, you are adamant that you must wear your finest clothes. And maybe on your Sabbath day you're adamant that the, the car must not crank and the fishing pole must not come out of the closet. And, 
and that you must get to church and, and you have to do this and this and you have all of these kind of sacred cows wrapped around this day and, and you find yourself thinking that because someone else doesn't observe it the way you observe it, you must be holier or more righteous before God because you've made these, these laws and these rules. And we see, brothers and sisters, in the pattern of the New Testament that the Pharisees were very good at making rules and following them on the Sabbath, but they lost the idea that the Sabbath is not set aside so that we seek some rules in order to be made right with God. The Sabbath is set aside so we sit in God. We rest in God. We worship God. And so do not make an idol out of the Sabbath. Do not think that somehow the way you observe it is the only way or the best way or the highest way because all we are doing now is becoming a legalist and a Pharisee. We must not base our standard before God solely on how we act on Sunday. Whether good or bad, that's not how we approach the Lord. I would say simply this, the Sabbath is a gift from God. A gift that we see fulfilled in Christ, that we rest in Him. I would encourage you as I'm about to pray, that probably one of the most encouraging things, and one we certainly don't have time to cover, is to read Hebrews chapter 4. And in Hebrews chapter 4, the writer is describing those who have left the faith or missed the faith or who have not come to Christ. And, and so he's talking about how they've missed rest. Because they rejected Christ, they've missed rest. And ultimately what he's describing is the time in which the Lord will return and we will rest forever in God's presence. And in Hebrews chapter 4, down along verse 11 or 12, he tells us these kind of uh, ironic words. He says, now strive, work towards rest. It's kind of a, uh, an oxymoron, really, work towards rest. And ultimately what he's saying is, walk with Christ, follow his way, obey his commandments. And then there is coming a day where he will return. And all of this rest that we kind of get on that one day a week will become eternal and forever. And every day will be Sunday. Every day will be rest day. Every day in the Lord will be Sabbath. So it encourages us. Don't give up. Don't give in. For now, it's one day a week. But there's coming a day where it will be all time, every day, for all eternity. May we rest in the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we ask you, Lord, to search our hearts and know us. This passage of Scripture is one that uh, Lord, it doesn't necessarily grip us emotionally like um, taking your name in vain or, or, or having idols. We, we really are struggle with how we comprehend Sabbath since we're not of the Jewish faith. We're believers in Christ. And, and even the pattern of our life, we worship on Sunday, Lord. That's what we do, the resurrection of Christ. And so it, this one, Lord, can be even further in antiquity to us, harder to reach in history. But but Lord, it's, it's your word and it's true and it's for us. And so I pray right now, Father, I pray for the one who finds themselves constantly busy. They work their job, they work their hobbies, they work their, their um, weekends, they chase their kids to everything known to man. They just find themselves constantly working and busy and the, the pattern of their life is simply, I, I need more time, I wish I had more time. Lord, I pray they would be convicted about ignoring the Sabbath and they would pull the plug and they would cut back on their calendar and they would set aside that day, that special day where they seek you and you alone. They rest in you. Lord, for many of them, it's a trust issue. They don't think you'll provide. They don't trust that you're watching over them. They think it's in their control or it's in their hands and that they have to toil in order to produce. And so, Lord, I pray you'd remind them that you're a God who watches over them and you're over all things. And they can trust you by resting in you. For some, Father, rest means they have to give up their sin. They have to confess their failures and they have to come to Christ. They find themselves lost and without Jesus and their life is in turmoil, their soul is twisted, their constant weight of agony of the sin in their life, the brokenness of the road that they've left behind. Lord, I pray they would come to Christ and hear the words of Jesus. Come to me, all you are levy laden, and I will give you rest. For some, 
The Sabbath is a place for a sacred cow, an idol. They think because they dress a certain way or they uh, have certain actions or they don't do certain rules that somehow they're more holy than others, they're, they're higher than others. Father, they find themselves in legalism when it comes to the Sabbath. Lord, I pray you'd break their heart and remind them that the Sabbath is not to be rules, it's not to be burdensome, it is to be freedom in Christ. And so, Lord, guard them from that. Father, I pray uh, that you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would bridge the gap that is so far from my words to the very truth that needs to be pressed on the heart. So, Lord God, please make the truth relevant and alive and real in each and every listener, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, church family. In a minute, we get to celebrate our Elkdale High School graduates of 2020. This has been a most amazing and unprecedented finish of the school year for our honored ones. To bring some normalcy to this year, we have compiled a short video highlighting each of them, and they will receive a gift from our church family, a copy of God's Word. Graduates, I've been so thankful for the time that God has given me with you as your youth pastor. I pray over each of you and leave you with these three things. First, Pursue God and seek Him out in your daily lives. God has made Himself available to you by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and His Word in front of you. Trust Him with your whole heart and follow Him. Second, God has promised to never leave His children or turn from them. In the hard moments and the easy moments, run towards God through prayer and with obedience. Third and finally, I pray for each of you in those times that you need answers the most, that you will turn to God's word, listen to God's people, and ask yourself, what's the wise thing to do? Church family, I'm excited to celebrate with you the Elkdale High School graduates of 2020. Hey, my name is Avery Adams. I'm graduating from Morgan Academy and I'll be attending the University of Alabama in the fall. I am currently undecided on my major. My favorite Bible verse is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is my favorite Bible verse because it reminds me that anything is possible and I can do anything with God by my side. To mom and dad, thank you for always pushing me to do my best and always being there for me when I need y'all. I love y'all both so much. To Britton, thank you for being my role model and being the best big brother or sister could have. Hey, my name is Maggie Colley and I'm graduating from Morgan Academy. I plan to attend Troy University and major in nursing. My favorite Bible verse is 1 Corinthians 13, 8 because this lets me know that God will never stop loving me. To my parents, thank you for everything you do for me and loving me no matter what. I love you both so much. Hey, my name is Matthew Davis. I'm graduating from Morgan Academy, and in the fall I'll be attending University of Arkansas, Little Rock, to play baseball, and I'm currently undecided in my major. My favorite Bible verse is Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. Uh, this is my favorite Bible verse because it reassures me that God is with me through everything and that He will never leave me. To mom and dad, I want to let y'all know that I love y'all and I can't thank y'all enough for everything y'all have done for me and given me. And to my brother Alex, uh, I want to thank you for always being a good example and being a good role model for me. Hey, my name is Cade Egbert and I'm graduating from Morgan Academy and I plan on going to Southern Union State Community College in Opelika. And I'm majoring in Megatronics and I plan to be a Megatronic technician. My favorite verse is Jeremiah 29 11 because God's plan is always far greater than our own. Thank you for taking care of me, and thank you for giving me values, and thank you for showing me what a great worth ethic is and loving me unconditionally. Thank you for all the great memories I have, 
and all the things that you've done for me. I love you. Hey, my name is MacArthur Nagbert. I am graduating from Warren Academy. I plan on attending Wallace Community College Selma in the fall to get my basics. After that, I plan on going to Trinum State to become an ultrasound tech. My favorite Bible verse is Romans 8.28 because it reminds me that God works for the ones who love Him. To Mom and Dad, thank you for making me the person I am today and all that you have done for me. I wouldn't be here without y'all. Love y'all. Hey, I'm Zach Johnson and I'm going to be graduating from International Community School of Bangkok, Thailand. I'm going to be majoring in Spanish at North Greenville University. My favorite verse of scripture is Philippians 4.13 because when I started trusting God with my life, I found out that I could do a lot more greater things than what I had already been doing. Hey mom and dad, I just want to say thanks for raising me the right way so I don't turn out bad and you've done a great job, I'll take it from here. Hello, my name is Thomas Morris and I'm graduating from Morgan Academy and uh, in the fall I'm going to see State Community College on a golf scholarship and I'm going to pursue business. And my favorite verse of scripture is Hebrews 1 verse 3 because I would like to look around in the world and just see how radiant it is with God's power. Mom, Dad, and Andrew, I love y'all. And I thank y'all for putting up with me for 18 years. You did a great job. Hey, my name is Emily Strickland. I will be graduating from Morgan Academy, and in the fall, I will be attending Mississippi State University and pursuing a major in civil engineering. My favorite verse is Jeremiah 29 11, and it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. And I like this verse because I know that no matter what, God has a plan for me and my future. To mom and dad, thanks for giving me everything that I could ever want or need. I love y'all. To Gage, try to hold down the fort while I'm gone. Love you, bud.